Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We are very delighted to have Gadi Gilam with us. So I would like to also thank uh, our UMB community, in particular the members of the Chronic Pain Research Center and uh, the member of the Placebo Beyond Opinion Centers. So we are delighted to be co-sponsored by the ISP, in particular the Pain and Placebo Seek. And today we have this special guest from Israel, and I will have um, a fellow of mine introducing Gadi. So I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Gadi Gilam. Um, Dr. Gilam obtained his PhD in 2017 in psychology and cognitive neuroscience at Tel Aviv University, Israel, under the supervision of Professor Tama Handler. Um, he then conducted a postdoctoral research fellowship in Stanford University's Division of Pain Medicine, um, where he worked with Professor Sean Amecki. Um, in 2021, um, he joined the Institute of Biomedical and Oral Research in the Faculty of Dental Medicine at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Israel, um, as an assistant professor. And he established his own lab, the Translational Social Cognitive and Effective Neuroscience Lab. Um, Gadi's novel research is bridging pain and emotion, um, delineating the complex connections between these two constructs, uh, which are inherently related. So thank you, Gadi, so much for joining us today from Israel, and we look forward to hearing you. Thank you very much, Ronnie, uh, for the intro, and thank, thank you uh, to you and to Luana and to uh, the Center at Maryland uh, for inviting me, and also, of course, for uh, this uh, great opportunity to share this with some of the members of uh, the IASP. Um, so it's really uh, great to be here, and, and indeed today I'll talk um, and present you some of my kind of thoughts and research. And in this uh, context of, of the relationship between pain and emotions. Um, and um, uh, to start off, um, I'd like to uh, take us to kind of think about how we talk about pain on a day-to-day -day basis, because we have this very intuitive way of, of using pain to express both uh, kind of quote unquote physical uh, pains, such as when we um, uh, accidentally drop a bowling ball on our leg, but also when we experience uh, mental or emotional or social pain, if we're ostracized or rejected, if we mourn uh, the loss of a loved one. Um, and, and day to day, we refer to all of this as, as pain. However, the fact that um, we, we cluster these subjective experiences into uh, this uh, kind of verbal category it does not mean that they necessarily share the same mechanistic uh, essence. This is an empirical question uh, worthy of our examination. But at the same time, there's also the, the clinical context, because as we, I think, all very well know, it's, it's crucial that we avoid invalidating uh, one's experience of pain, whether they refer to it as physical or mental or whatever. By, uh, by doing so, we actually may make things much worse. And we want to avoid that stigma of letting someone uh, feel that this is uh, all in their head, so to speak, and um, lending to a non, a non existent experience. Um, so, with, with that in mind, what I'd like to um, talk to you today about is a little bit about the, the notion uh, of what an emotion is and dissociated from emotion regulation processes. And I'll illustrate that. Uh, with a couple of examples of some of my work in the context of anger, and then use that as a segue to kind of bring us back and think again about what is pain, and through that discuss the relationship between pain and emotional and emotions, and um, take several uh, perspectives from the theoretical to the empirical, and also to, to some of the clinical aspects. Um, so to start off, we may ask, what is uh, an emotion, right? Uh, a question that uh, philosophically and religiously, as, 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 as human beings, we've been dealing with for, for several thousand years, whether it's the ancient uh, Western or Eastern traditions. However, uh, from a modern scientific perspective, um, I really like this quotation by Ferran Rosser, who wrote that everyone knows what an emotion is until asked to give a definition. And it's crucial to have definitions in order for us to be able to, to measure, to manipulate, to really understand the, uh, the underlying mechanisms. And, and one of the biggest challenges is that within the field of emotion science, 
there really isn't one single uh, psychobiological definition for, for emotion. And this nice illustration uh, by Gloss and Barrett uh, shows, uh, even though unidimensionally, how many different perspectives there, perspectives there, there are out there, categorized into four main uh, kind of emotional theory categories. Um, and, and one of the first to actually um, provide or, or, or generate a, uh, an initial per, uh, theoretical perspective um, or scientific perspective on motion is, is not other than William James, who is, uh, you know, the forefather of psychological science and in his seminal paper, What is an Emotion, uh, wrote that the bodily changes follow directly the perception of the exciting fact and that our feeling of the same changes as they occur is the emotion. Uh, in other words, when we see this image of, uh, uh, of a snake or a potential threat, there are these physiological responses and uh, our heart beats and, and we increase our, uh, our breathing rates, we may sweat, and our ability to experience these physiological changes is in itself the emotion. So a priori, um, the first uh, uh, perspective or scientific approach to, uh, or a theory to emotion was based on how emotions are inherent to our uh, bodily experiences. Um, now, obviously I'm not gonna go through all of the different nuances between these uh, various emotion theories, but to try to provide us some common grounds, it is generally agreed that emotions have three fundamental and largely independent features. Uh, the first is indeed the, the arousal, the physiological activation of, of our nervous system, uh, motivational aspect, which refers to the tendency to approach or avoid um, a certain stimuli, and the valids, the, the evaluation of, uh, of the stimuli as whether it's positive or negative on that spectrum. And so we may think about emotional experiences as uh, outcomes of interactions between these bottom-up pathways from the peripheral nervous system with the top-down functionality of the central nervous system with cognitive and metacognitive processes. And these varies can be, uh, these patterns can be uh, shaped and, and fashioned uh, by sociocultural context. And this to varying degrees depends on theoretical approach, also co-occurring with various behavioral expressions, whether they're facial, bodily, verbal, again, dependent on the theoretical perspective. One thing that I, I do not, uh, think is necessarily agreed by all perspectives, but I think it's crucial from my perspective at least, um, is that we cannot reduce the emotional experiences to the nature of the eliciting stimulus. In other words, the emotion is not, or fear is not in the roar of the lion, right? If uh, if it's we're alone and, and at night in the middle of the savanna, our experience of that roar will be very different if we're uh, with our kids or family at, uh, at the zoo. And a nice uh, study that illustrates this, I think, is, uh, uh, is the following one conducted by uh, Hillel Abiezer, uh, also from Hebrew, Hebrew U, where he took these uh, prototypical um, uh, uh, faces reflecting uh, uh, these Ekman uh, emotions. In this case, this is, um, uh, this is portraying disgust. And he showed how um, when we embed this uh, prototypical face with different bodily postures, we can actually uh, uh, understand them as reflecting other emotional experiences. So in A, we can indeed uh, uh, um, identify this as disgust when this uh, uh, a body posture holds a diaper, but with an aggressive kind of posture, uh, people identify this in anger. Uh, in this mournful posture, people um, identify this uh, uh, pretty consistently also as sadness, and to some extent, even as fear. Um, so this is one important point, and another one that I would like to highlight is uh, the uh, the nature also of emotion regulation, which refers to the processes by which individuals modulate which emotions they have, when they have them, um, and how they experience and express them. Now, when we look at the, uh, the brain, there is a tendency to dissociate between uh, regions that are commonly uh, associated with emotion regulation compared to emotional activity. And these regions, which are pretty consistently responsive to, um, to these processes, um, are also differentiated best on, based on the uh, experimental paradigm. So, for example, if we tell participants explicitly in what strategy to regulate their emotions, almost like uh, Yoda telling us to use the force, 
we see certain uh, mostly uh, cortical regions that are being engaged. So if it's a, an, a, an attention-based emotion regulation strategy, we usually see parietal regions, or if it's a semantic-based strategy, we would see commonly ventral lateral prefrontal cortex regions and so forth. However, studies also look at implicit emotion regulation, uh, whereby they look at individual differences, for example, between a, a young uh, a Skywalker and a cool employee with Han Solo. And commonly, when trapping into these individual differences without explicitly telling participants to regulate your emotions, uh, we see the ventral medial prefrontal cortex as pretty consistently engaged um, in those responses. Now, no matter which strategy participants use or, or which paradigm is being applied, we see a common set of regions that are a target for these uh, regulatory processes, most commonly, of course, the amygdala crucially involved in negative affect, but also subcortical regions, such as the paracritical gray, um, and, and especially also the uh, two regions that are commonly uh, uh, coupled and uh, respond to salient stimuli in our environment, the dorsal and teresing reef cortex, and the insula. Um, let me illustrate this uh, with a couple of studies that I conducted in the context of anger. And there's definitely much to say about anger, but without going too much into details, anger is an adaptive response. Uh, it helps us cope with a uh, potential threat. Uh, it allows us to uh, signal potential breach of social norms, allows us to overcome barriers and, and challenges. But it is also a very strong negative emotional experience. It can damage our personal and social uh, lives. And it impacts cognitive processing. It is very strongly uh, associated with aggressive behavior, even though it is not the same thing, which is important to clarify that we can be angry without being aggressive and vice versa. Um, and it is also a risk factor for various medical conditions, including, for example, risk factor. It's also very common in chronic pain. Um, and other psychopathologies. Now, in one of our first studies to try to understand the potential near basis for anger regulation, we indeed looked at individual differences to provocations and that of the social decision-making paradigm. And we were able to identify um, a region in the anterior ventral medial prefrontal cortex that responded to these interpersonal provocations and seems to modulate uh, the angry feelings and reduce them and route to reduced aggressive behaviors. And we're able to show some clinical relevance for this uh, finding by showing that these activations predicted that one year later, the severity of chronic stress symptoms. And yet we wanted to uh, take a further step and try to provide potential uh, causal evidence for, uh, for this potential model. And so we use the technique called transparent direct current stimulation, or TDCS, whereby we apply a weak electrical currents over the scalp, uh, thereby altering temporarily brain function. When there's a positive electrode, there is an increase in action of potentials, a uh, facilitation of uh, engagement of those regions. And so we hypothesize that if we're able to target the VMPFC and increase it, its activation during uh, an anger-inducing paradigm, uh, we will see reductions in anger and aggression. Um, but uh, TDCS is also limited in its uh, uh, specificity, the electrical currents distribute across the scalp. And so we wanted to verify that we we're actually tapping into the VMPFC. So we did this simultaneously inside uh, the fMRI scanner. And we were able to show that during the uh, salient angering um, unfair provocations, not only did we see this increase in uh, activation in the VMPFC, uh, which uh, also showed uh, in parallel reduction in subjective reports of anger, reductions in aggressive behaviors. Um, what we also found was downstream effect at the ACC and uh, left insula clusters. Um, so uh, this was a, a very exciting result. Of course, there are limitations. We found group results. We didn't find it consistently across all of the participants. There's still much to do, and these are all healthy participants. But seeing these two regions has always struck me, like I'm sure many others, how they're continuously appearing in a lot of different salient experiences. And of course, from the perspective of pain, of pain, these are classic regions that in the past have been kind of key markers of the so-called pain matrix. And this is illustrated also here in this classic uh, paper by Coggio and colleagues, showing uh, uh, together with the thalamus and together with um, uh, somatosensory regions, 
um, the ACC and the insula increase their activation as we move into higher, uh, higher um, noxious thermal stimuli. So let's transition and talk a little bit also about pain, going to some of the things that we uh, as a community also are very much aware of, that the pain has evolved to avoid tissue damage, to protect our body and keep the integrity of the tissue. In fact, we do not necessarily need to experience pain in order for our body to engage these reflexes in trying to protect us. At the same time, pain is an unpleasant experience and, and can lead to a lot of suffering, especially in chronic pain. And so there's uh, this kind of uh, question about whether pain, is it a sensory experience uh, or has a sensory goal or, or a, a, an emotional experience? And, and again, we can trace it all the way 2,000 years ago to Aristotle, who initially placed pain as a counter to pleasure, uh, processed in the heart and reflecting a uh, passion or an emotion. While 400, about 400 years later, Galen, who, uh, like other uh, sensory systems such as vision and audition, uh, placed that uh, pain in the brain as a sensory system. In fact, till this day, pain is usually studied in, in various textbooks as part of the sensory system. Of course, moving 2,000 years forward, we recognize and know that pain is both a, a sensory and an emotional experience. And in fact, I believe we cannot truly understand pain if we don't place nociception next to it. Uh, the important process of encoding these um, objective uh, stimuli from uh, the environment to biologically meaningful stimuli that travel through our body uh, to our central nervous system. And of course, only when this information reaches our brain can we fully experience pain, consider its different qualities, its uh, exact location, and so forth. And of course, the brain also has the, uh, the, the, the great capacity to also engage these descending pathways to modulate our experience or change our, our behavior accordingly. Um, one thing that I would like to also highlight is how Pain is also impacted, again, by the psychosocial context of our experiences. And I'd like to demonstrate this with this massive paper by Loja and colleagues. And, and they looked at uh, a response to uh, a thermal stimuli before and after uh, a manipulation, which uh, um, either generated positive affective link by showing uh, movies of a protagonist, sharing how they're coping with, uh, for example, the loss of their my girlfriend, um, or a negative effective link. Uh, for example, that same protagonist, um, um, you know, talking about how they took advantage of, uh, of a disabled person. Um, now, what they showed in their testing is that at baseline, there were no differences between these two groups, the group with a positive effective link and that with a negative effect effective link, we see the classic responses as the temperature increases, uh, there are higher ratings of the pain intensity uh, without any differences between the groups. Uh, but after uh, this manipulation, they first show that indeed uh, the group with a positive effective link report on being in a state of heightened uh, uh, empathy. And when they look at changes in the response to the exact same stimuli, that group with a positive effective link actually reports more pain compared to the group with the negative effective link that reports less pain. And so this comes to this crucial side note that we have in the definition of pain as always being a personal experience that is influenced not only by the biological factors, but also the psychological and the sociocultural factors. So hopefully we can again agree that there isn't necessarily a one-to-one -one, a relationship between the physical properties of the stimulus the sensory encoding and the actual experience. And there's other examples for that, for example, when we use anesthesia or in effects such as aluminia. So for that matter, pain is not in the heat of the thermal. Um, so pain is a contextualized multidimensional construct and we can view it as reflecting interaction between the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. We cannot reduce it to the nociceptive processing, and emotion is inherent to its, its definition. However, in view of what I just told you, and this is, of course, part of the rhetoric that I'm trying to bring forward, how can we fully understand pain when the age-old question about what is an emotion is still so vigorously debated? 
what do we actually mean when we say that pain is emotional? So one of the greatest interests that I have and I try to push forward is trying to understand the relationship between pain and emotion. There are different theoretical perspectives. If we look at panel A in this illustration, we may think um, like the current definition that emotion is a kind of sub subcomponent of pain. But um, some might uh, argue that uh, pain is, uh, so to speak, another type of emotion. And so maybe it's what we are illustrating in panel B. Um, I think for my own personal goal, um, it is clear that uh, there are bi-directional influences between pain and emotion that we need to better understand. There is obvious uh, conceptual, mechanistic, empirical, and also clinical um, overlap and, and relationships between pain and emotion. And so I think as a field, we need to approach what is illustrated in panel C and understand what are the boundaries, what are the limitations, and how they affect one another. In that sense, it was surprising for me to a certain extent growing up uh, in the world of, of the pain field and the emotion field that by and large, the two fields are pretty much siloed one from the other. I think there is uh, room to deepen the relationship both from an empirical and from a, a fields kind of perspective. And both fields can definitely benefit from that. So how can we do that? Obviously by studying more pain and emotion uh, together and their bi-directional influence, but also by considering how we uh, communicate about emotions and other affective states and their intertwined experiences in the context of pain. Uh, this is, I think, crucial in the patient-clinician interaction um, by fostering cross-field discussions, collaborations, maybe joint task force, especially highlighting funding mechanisms, uh, which I think is crucial. And, and of course, by trying to, at the more kind of institutional level, discipline uh, level, try to avoid and remove barriers as much as we can to facilitate these discussions. Um, one thing that I think is important is, uh, or, or should I say one uh, uh, initial step that I have taken in this direction is trying to understand uh, what happens in the brain. And, um, uh, and I did this using uh, uh, a tool called Neurosynth, which allows to generate uh, meta-analytic maps of various uh, of virus construct, virus terms. And what I did is I took uh, these meta-analytic maps for, uh, for both pain, this is around 600 studies, neuroimaging human studies on pain, and uh, around 1,000 uh, under the term emotional. And, and just to highlight how, the, the point of how much of an overlap there is between regions that are engaged in the processing of these experiences, both in classic regions such as uh, in the amygdala, uh, but also in uh, more somatosensor regions that maybe are more relevant to kind of actual physical pain. Of course, in the insula and in the ACC, we're finding these overlap. And of course, we know that this is only a crude reflection, but I think it was a starting point uh, to try to push in that direction, at least from my, from my perspective. Um, one thing that uh, I think remains so clear and confounding about pain is the fact that uh, we do have nociception as a, a very important process, um, also evolutionarily speaking. We can trace uh, uh, the basic mechanisms uh, uh, of nociception 500 million years ago to some of the most primitive organisms such as sea elegans and uh, arthropods and, source, and so forth. Um, at the same time, we have yet to identify such peripheral pathway uh, for so-called uh, fearception or angerception or any other emotion category for that matter. So I think at the same time, we can also think about pain as a very unique um, affective experience in that sense and consider how it may relate to other emotional experiences. Now, there are several fundamental questions that both fields ask and, and can be also put side by side. For example, um, do uh, pain and emotions have distinct behavioral expressions? Or do any one of them have uh, specific biological fingerprints? Do, emotion, do animals have pain or emotions or uh, what develops through time uh, and throughout development and uh, how we experience pain and emotions? 
and also how and which uh, neural systems are engaged while we're uh, regulating uh, pain and emotions. And this is one question that I have interest in and had the ability to study within a, a large RCT conducted uh, at Stanford, which looked at the biobehavioral mechanisms um, of uh, two treatments. One arm was, was focused on acupuncture, the one on pain CBT and MBSR. So two treatments uh, that were initially in the 70s and so forth developed to tackle psychopathology and are considered uh, frontline treatments for chronic pain. Um, today, I'm sharing you some, uh, uh, some uh, results from the uh, baseline neuroimaging scan related to this large project in which we uh, recruited chronic flow back pain patients and trained them to use reappraisal, also termed uh, reframe, and acceptance, also termed observe, as two emotion regulation strategies that are also considered part of the uh, therapeutic effects of CBT and MBSR, respectively. So this is, of course, needed to be taken with a grain of salt. It's still in the publication process, um, not formally out yet. Uh, but what we did um, is we first individually calibrated um, um, noxious thermal stimuli, heat stimuli, to a five or a six, around five, six on a zero to pain intensity scale. Um, and this uh, was applied to the lower back using the um, uh, MR compatible uh, pathway uh, MEDOC system. Um, and participants um, uh, had about 40 uh, pseudorandom uh, trials, um, 10 of each of these four conditions. Uh, one uh, condition was a, a rest, no pain condition. Um, another condition was a respond condition, which was a no regulation uh, condition where pain is applied again to the low back, but the participants are asked to uh, not try to change the experience. And the two emotion regulation strategies, one was reframe to reinterpret the way that uh, they think about pain to make it less aversive and observe a mindful kind of non-judgment uh, um, observation of the unfolding of the moment to moment experience. And after each trial, participants uh, rated both their pain intensity and pain unpleasantness. Um, we had a nice group of uh, 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 low back uh, uh, pain uh, participants and also uh, a group of healthy controls. I'm going to show you a little bit, not all the results, but, but some of the results from this study, starting with the behavioral results, um, which show this uh, uh, significant interaction uh, indicating uh, to the left are the back pain uh, and to the right are the healthy controls. And we can see that the pattern is, is pretty much uh, similar in the sense that there are reductions in subjective pain reports. And these are collapsed across intensity and unpleasantness because we find no differences between them. Um, and there is a significant decrease from the pain no regulation respond to the observed and another significant decrease for refrain. And the same pattern also for healthy controls, not much of a group differences here, even though um, we are seeing a larger kind of uh, uh, baseline response to pain for the uh, patients compared to the controls, although both of them are around about, uh, around the, the calibration, um, the calibration pain uh, that, that we uh, conducted. Um, so we do see reframe as, as slightly more efficient, even though we can also see that the, uh, the average reduction is of about uh, 10%, so one point on a zero to 10 scale. Um, now, when we look at the brain, again, not going through all the contrast, but here showing the contrast for reframe in orange, so the reappraisal strategy is engaging classic regions that we know from reappraisal and reframe studies uh, using emotional pictures or emotional movies. Uh, this uh, left-oriented uh, semantic processing regions, including Gouka, the IFG, and Wernicke, uh, a little bit of the temporal pole, and also the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex regions. And what we can also see is that they seem to target uh, these uh, uh, classic uh, uh, pain-related, uh, pain processing-related regions, specifically anterior, right anterior insula and left posterior insula, showing reductions during the engagement uh, with, uh, with this strategy. Uh, comparing the two strategies, uh, we actually showed nicely how each strategy is uh, engaging their own kind of relevant 
uh, system, uh, reframe, engaging more the IFG, uh, the temporal pole here, so the semantic processing and cognitive related regions in the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, while the observed, the more attention related uh, strategy engaging precuneus and cuneus regions and uh, um, uh, inferior, superior and inferior bilateral uh, regions that we can see also here. Um, what uh, we didn't see here, which was a little bit of a surprise, especially considering uh, these strategies impact from other studies um, in, in healthy controls and uh, in the context of emotion, that we saw no uh, specific response of the amygdala. So we also conducted beyond the whole brain, a region of interest uh, uh, analysis, and as illustrated here, we did not find any specific modulation of this region. Um, now, the, the amygdala is considered important also uh, to, uh, uh, to pain, um, uh, potentially in, in, in tagging the, the effective aspect of, 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 of nociceptive experiences or painful experiences, um, as shown also in animal studies and in other human studies, but uh, we did not find a specific uh, modulation in our case. Um, so, so this is one example of how we also study this, this link and this relationship, um, but I want to uh, shift gears a little bit and talk uh, about a different um, analytic and, and research-oriented approach, but also a little bit more focused on the nature of chronic pain. Um, as, as I'm sure uh, we all know, um, chronic primary pain uh, manifests in many different ways but is uh, classically um, classified according to the anatomical location of pain, whether it's uh, visceral regions, whether it's orofacial uh, uh, pain, uh, widespread pain. This is how the ICD codes chronic pain conditions. Um, at the same time, all of these conditions share a global functional impairment in domain general symptoms, whether these are physical, or social, and especially psychological. There are uh, incredibly high comorbidities between um, depression, anxiety, anger, these negative affect-related factors, and, uh, and chronic pain. Uh, some studies indicate that there is maybe uh, twice, sometimes even three times more uh, of a chance to experience also depression and anxiety if you have chronic pain compared to not having that. And so this led us to think whether um, we can actually use uh, this combination of domain general symptoms, which are non-specific to pain, to actually empirically classify one's chronic pain condition and potentially use them as quotative markers for clinical diagnosis uh, and prognosis. And within this clinical-oriented uh, question, there's also some mechanistic question of whether we would see if we're able to generate these new groups of patients with chronic pain, will they differentiate based on the intensity of these symptoms as illustrated to the left with a graded scale kind of severity, or will we see a differential pattern altogether in the sense that one symptom or several symptoms will be very unique and specific to uh, certain groups compared to the other. So in that sense, uh, instead of looking at symptoms to a certain extent, almost as uh, only the endpoint of, of how people are classified as chronic pain, um, we're, we're wondering whether we can uh, reverse the paradigm, so to speak, and actually use these symptoms to classify uh, the condition of chronic pain. And then, based on the patterns of symptoms, try to provide potentially more personalized treatments that is related in a more specific way uh, to those symptoms that are more, uh, um, you know, more salient and apparent in these people. So to do that, we need two things. We need uh, lots of data and we need also the analytic approach. So uh, we utilized uh, Stanford's Collaborative uh, Health Outcomes Information Registry, essentially a learning healthcare system that synergizes between clinical practice and between uh, research opportunities. Um, the uh, choir system essentially sends these uh, surveys to all patients going to uh, the Stanford Pain Clinics across the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and this registry includes uh, uh, questions about personal and medical background, but also uh, many questions uh, related to uh, patient reported outcomes. And in fact, uh, uh, the promise uh, computerized adaptive testing is implemented within this system. 
Now, a clinician can use this uh, illustration um, to uh, support their process of uh, the clinical intake, uh, seeing the, the scores of this participant, seeing where they mark their actual experience of pain, whether there are changes across time, and so forth. Uh, of course, uh, for, for research, we can utilize this, uh, this data to ask various questions. So this is where we uh, obtain our data. In terms of the analytic approach, we actually use a fairly simple unsupervised machine learning uh, algorithm called hierarchical agglomerated clustering, whereby the underlying assumption is that within the data, we'll be able to generate groups um, of, of, of patients, of data points, where within the group, there is a, a very small variability, but between groups, large variability, which allows to differentiate, as in this example, between the red, the green, and uh, the blue data points. Um, and this is, uh, occurs in a, a recursive bottom-up process uh, illustrated to the left in a simplistic two-dimensional way um, where we look at the distances between data points and we gradually, little by little, start to group them together and build this a mathematical representation, a, a dendrogram, um, that until we get to one cluster um, or one group that has all uh, the data points. And then uh, using, uh, using various techniques, we can determine how or what is the optimal uh, number of, of clusters. So um, how did we implement this in our current study? Uh, we used 75% of the entire database uh, in choir at the time when we conducted this study. So this included about 11 and a half thousand uh, 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 records of patients. Um, and we uh, um, uh, used what we call as these domain general clustering symptoms across three domains, physical, psycho, uh, psychological, or emotional, and social, and ran this uh, um, uh, algorithm. Now, even though this is a, a data-driven uh, project, we did uh, 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 have the expectation that and hypothesize that, that these negative affect-related symptoms will be um, crucial in determining um, the, the different clusters and to which cluster each uh, patient would be relevant based on, um, hopefully uh, you're on the same page with me with, with all that I just shared with you. Um, uh, so this was the first stage. In the second stage, we wanted to provide some diagnostic validation based on pain-specific measures. And so here we used uh, pain intensity, the number of body regions in pain, uh, uh, measures like pain interference, and even psychological constructs such as uh, pain catastrophizing. We, um, uh, we later uh, validated uh, the robustness of our data with the two additional subsets of the data, which comprise the 25% uh, of additional data. Uh, and then within an additional smaller subset of about 1,300 uh, patients, we also had longitudinal follow-up data three to 12 months uh, uh, from the baseline measurement. And we use that to examine whether there's any prognostic uh, value to these uh, clusters, to these empirical clusters. So um, this is a, a broad overview of the demographics of the entire sample, which is about 16,500 uh, patients. Remember, it's all around the San Francisco Bay Area, so we do see a fairly large uh, level of college uh, education. Um, and the other demographic factors are maybe not that far from other samples, but at the same time, it's important to remember this is a, a tertiary clinic, so um, uh, not the same as, uh, as other clinics. Um, but um, I don't go too much into the demographics because actually we find no meaningful differences um, within uh, our results uh, according to these demographic measures. Um, this is the actual results of the algorithm uh, where we obtained uh, three clusters. Um, one cluster, um, which um, comprises about 50% of the data, and two additional clusters, each of about a quarter of the data. And um, we labeled them cluster one, two, and three, uh, and, and now you'll see why, when we actually looked at uh, the patterns um, of the symptoms. So we'll start with one symptom, which in this case is fatigue, showing us that um, as we move from cluster one to cluster two to cluster three, there is a gradual increase in the level of fatigue um, across each of these uh, uh, groups. Now, this kind of stage and gradual uh, uh, pattern 
actually manifested in each and every one of the uh, uh, symptoms that were fed into the algorithm. So we are expecting to see very strong differences between these three clusters. That is the goal of the algorithm. But uh, the pattern in this sense is, is pretty um, interesting to see and uh, associated again with this gradual increase. Now, of course, the important thing would be to find how is this manifested in the uh, pain specific symptoms that were independent from the actual algorithm. And here, as you can see illustrated first with pain intensity, we're continuing to see this exact same pattern moving from cluster one to cluster three with a gradual increase of severity. And again, this uh, is what we find in every one of uh, the different measures that we have, including physical function, including pain catastrophizing, uh, very nice and sizable effect sizes. Um, and, uh, and I should uh, take uh, another deeper look also at um, the, uh, the results in terms of the body map, because we also uh, measured how many regions uh, patients report in which they experience their pain, and there were a total of 74 regions, uh, but we could also categorize these segments into 11, uh, uh, 11 specific body locations. This was uh, validated in, in some of the uh, work cited here. And uh, we can then ask whether there is any specific region or location in uh, these body uh, kind of mannequins that are associated with the clusters that we identified. Um, so here again, a, a zoom in on the actual results of the number of segments. So it's not necessarily uh, because the size of the segments are different. It's not necessarily that it's about 20, 25% of uh, the body that is marked in pain, but it's clearly more regions um, associated with the worst cluster, which is cluster three, so potentially indicating uh, uh, widespread uh, pain or chronic overlapping pain conditions. But when we looked at uh, the, the different uh, actual body locations, we found no association. So if one uh, is uh, um, suffering from, from chronic low back pain, then there is equal chances that they will be in any one of uh, these clusters. And this kind of supports the rationale of our work to try to maybe kind of leave the classic uh, anatomical based uh, uh, classification of chronic pain and using potentially what we're offering here. But another thing that, that we did in terms of thinking how to support this clinically or how these results can support clinical efforts is showing how uh, the different clustering symptoms are contributing to the overall separability between the clusters. Or in other words, if a new patient now arrives and we ran the classifier, what will be the most important factors in determining to which cluster they will belong? And we're seeing that indeed the negative affect related factors primarily depression and anxiety, but together also with anger, explain 42% uh, of the variability. So, so by and large, we can very, very broadly support the notion that indeed CBT and MBSR could be frontline kind of treatments for people suffering long term from chronic pain. Now, we replicated these results in the two additional data sets, but to save time and move forward, let's look also at the prognostic-like validation where we're looking at data from the second time point, so three to 12 months uh, in the future, but based on uh, the identification of clusters at time point one. And what we found is that um, if you were in cluster one, then you will uh, potentially continue to be and the least severe group. And so this pattern at the group level uh, is shown here in fatigue and in fact shown uh, similarly in all of our different measures. Um, so on the one hand, there is some prognostic value for these, these clusters, uh, but at the same time, it's a pretty pessimistic um, kind of uh, result because it means that potentially if you're stuck at cluster two or any cluster, um, especially if it's cluster three, then you almost have no way to escape. So to try to see if that's indeed the case, we actually ran the classifier separately um, also on the second time point for these uh, patients. And what we actually found was that while indeed 70% um, of the patients remained in the same cluster, 30% moved. And, and they moved to a lot of different reasons that we don't really know because we don't have the access to, and there may be some statistical effects going on here. Some maybe are getting the, the, the good uh, treatment or accurate, uh, others not. 
Um, but what we wanted to quantify is whether these results are, are real in the sense that uh, is there any um, uh, problem of measurement or is there an issue with how we uh, run these uh, uh, classifiers. So we generated a bootstrap distribution um, trying to assess on average how much patients would move from different clusters. And we found that there is a very, very small chance that there will indeed, uh, that these changes are, are attributed to, to an error. And, and, and this is a, a more uh, optimistic uh, view because it does indicate that um, these uh, clusters um, or, or the assignment of, of a cluster is not necessarily indicative of a, of a static condition. There, be, there might be various factors that can affect the long-term dynamics. And, and this opens for us a, a window of opportunity to try to target and personalize interventions. One potential approach could be as illustrated here. So thinking of patient C, belonging to cluster theory, and we see their values of the clustering symptoms in the black bars. Uh, in blue, the mean of the US general population. These are T-scores. And in red are the centroids. So we obviously see very high depression uh, relevant to how we uh, understand the role of these uh, uh, symptoms in determining their cluster. We actually see a fairly low level of the physical measurements that we have, but we also find um, high levels of social isolation. So in support of the clinical decision-making process, one potential uh, way of moving forward with this person is providing them uh, depression-related treatment in a social group support uh, uh, way. And this might be helpful. Of course, we'll need to show in future work whether we're actually showing downstream impact on this person's pain-specific related measurements. So, so there's still, of course, lots to do, but one uh, preliminary data that might show some uh, optimal or at least uh, optimistic uh, opportunity uh, uh, is based on a collaboration with my dear friend and colleague, Maisa Ziadni, who developed a, uh, uh, a single session uh, telehealth delivered treatment called pain, stress, and emotions. And uh, she showed that there was, uh, in, the, the, in this proof of concept study, a benefit for the treatment. And we used that to assess changes in the cluster assignments uh, for the participants. So this is all uh, preliminary. Uh, none of this is inferential. These are small numbers, but they are by and large showing that there is uh, an increase in the number of the people that are labeled in cluster one in the lower clusters, uh, which, which means that there might be um, a good way of, of seeing how these cluster identifications can respond to, to treatment. So of course, there is much to do here. But generally, I think uh, this represents a potential approach for a cost-effective way of, uh, of kind of a precision-based clinical approach where we can also identify high-impact chronic pain and try to provide uh, kind of targets uh, that might be uh, modifiable. Um, obviously, there's more to do here and see whether we can take this from the subjective level to potential um, underlying mechanisms and, and biomarkers. One thing I also think this highlights is, again, the synergistic opportunities of thinking also theoretically and empirically with uh, uh, psychiatry and, and psychopathology, because it indicates that there might be a kind of uh, transdiagnostic dimension for how we think about chronic pain. And, and, and this parallels some of the changes going on in the last decade in psychopathology in uh, projects like RDOC by the NIMH or HITOP or the P factor, general kind of transdiagnostic uh, dimensions for, for psychopathology. And again, echoing what I tried to illustrate earlier about the potential also at the clinical level for the two fields to learn from each other. Of course, there are limitations and we need to generalize these results. Hopefully, I'll be able to replicate some of this work in Israel. Um, but because this is non-specific to pain, we can also think on other chronic conditions where we know that symptoms, managing them is an issue, and we could consider implementing similar approaches. Um, if these kind of approaches are generally relevant and interesting to you, um, I would like to plug in and invite you to uh, our session, our symposium at the European uh, Pain Federation Congress in September, where together with uh, Yeni Serkus Almeida and Etienne vichon Prasso will provide various uh, similar, um, but also different approaches that are based on this kind of biopsychosocial approach uh, for personalized uh, chronic pain. Um, and and to just to summarize, I guess, 
Um, what I'm saying here is actually reflected in the approach that, uh, that we as a young lab are trying to do, focus on mechanisms of, uh, um, of uh, affective states at their intersection of both chronic pain and mental health combining cognitive neuroscience, experimental psychology, um, and, and taking inspiration from this uh, uh, vast uh, knowledge, both in emotion science and social and health psychology and pain medicine and so forth. Um, so at this point, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. I'd like to thank my supervisors and mentors and various collaborators in the project that I presented, the funding, and also plug that we are a new and young lab with open positions, so anybody interested, um, feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was very, very interesting. So we have time for questions. Those people who are in the audience can use the Q&A or I, you can text me and I will uh, move you to the stage as a panelist. I have a question, uh, Gadi. Yeah. So this kind of clusters that you show are very inspiring and uh, interesting. How do you think we can use cluster and the fact that dynamically patient can change, you know, from one cluster more severe to one less severe to adjust uh, a psychological but also pharmacological treatment? And uh, among all this, uh, large, uh, you know, cohort of patients, do you know if there is a difference between those who are pharmacological treated versus people who do not rely merely on uh, pharmacological treatments? Um, oh, sorry, maybe uh, first I also stop this so I can see you better. Um, so, Honestly, I don't know. There's so much, uh, uh, so much to do. I think um, this is really just for me was a starting point of trying to learn what we can do with that. There, I think, is so much variability probably in these patients. They're going through so many treatments, and there's so many treatments out there, both ph pharmacological and not. So, um, do you have access to this data? The medical history. Uh, I, I think at least when, when I was working with this data, one of the biggest challenges was related to how can these systems relate with the electronic medical records and, and all the HIPAA related aspects. And this is a world of its own that um, I have not gone into details of as, uh, as a researcher, I was actually taking advantage of the opportunity of having access to uh, the data at the pain division at Stanford. I believe they are doing uh, a lot of progress in trying to combine all these words, uh, worlds and all these different data points to, to get to consider how the specific treatments and how the pharmacological aspects or other more invasive interventions might relate to, you know, to such clusters or, or generally to, to such approaches. Um, but we didn't have that at the time. Um, but um, I think I think it will go over there. We'll get there soon. We have a question. Have you measured any autonomic variables, for example, heart rate variability in your studies? So generally in my studies, we have used it more in my work conducted on um, Actually, in one of the anger studies, we had uh, we had the um, not heart rate variability. We had sympathetic activity measured through galvanic skin response, and we found uh, that it also correlated with the behavioral responses in the task and associated with anger response. Uh, specifically in this clustering data, everything is just based on self-report, and there are obviously so much to do there uh, with with more objective measures. Thank you. Well, uh, if we don't have any other questions, I would like again to thank all of you for your participation and in particular our speaker. Thank you very much for joining us today. It has been a very inspiring and insightful lecture. So I would like also to invite all of you to stay tuned with us. We will uh, restart this series next um, academic year. This was the last for uh, the 2023 series. 
And we plan to do again uh, the series of lecture hybrid in person and virtual next academic year. For those who are around, we will have uh, still time for other questions. So we have Diane, psychiatrist, poet, founder, director of Art and Healing Resilience Center in Oregon. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. The short film animation, Marble Me Free, in our physical and emotional pain as expressed by Sterling One, who has complex regional pain syndrome. We are eager to utilize this movie in support of treatment for chronic pain. How does one collaborate for research? <laughs> Thank you. I, I don't know. <laughs> Send well, me an email. We can talk. Yes. Okay, Diane, please contact our speaker and they will share his insight. Another question. Could you research, use this research also for prevention of suicide? Wow, um, I, 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 I wouldn't place uh, that, that much value into just the research. There's, I'm sure, so much more, and I personally uh, do not have the, the, the knowledge in terms of the important aspect of suicide research, so, so I don't know how it would be implemented, but I'm always open to talking with people and bounce off ideas. Another question by Ian Kleckner here at the University of Maryland School of Nursing. I was curious if you thought about how nociception versus neuropathic versus nociplastic pain relates to the concept of pain versus emotion. Wow, huge question. Uh, so interesting. Um, I've not gone there uh, yet. I think obviously there's so much going on uh, with the definitions of kind of mechanistic aspects of, of chronic pain with these three illustrations uh, that, um, um, that were brought up. Um, I think one of this kind of, again, a little bit of a tease that I made, that I made by saying that we do have nociception for pain, but we don't seem to have angerception or fearception, at least not too much in the peripheral ways. There are some subcortical circuits that um, I think some researchers and theorists uh, consider as being evolution, of course, evolution developed and maybe providing a basis for resp emotional responses to threat. Um, and so to a certain extent, maybe some of the pathological manifestations that we see in psychopathology, um, there seem to be indications that they relate to those systems. At the same time, they're still centralized systems and not peripheral systems. Um, so um, definitely something to think about more. I'm not sure if I responded, but maybe it's touching the point in a way. Great, thank you. So it looks like uh, we have only one minute left and no questions. So we can say hi to everyone and thank you again.